where the IJ entry is the number of edges to line and check. Okay, so here's an example on the blackboard. There's a directed graph. I've labeled each edge with its name. Okay, so four names. Um, the edge set is the set ABCD. Uh, there's the adjacency matrix. Uh, there's one edge from first vertex one to the uh, itself. There are two edges from the first vertex one to two, etc. Okay, well, so, and you can see that if you have a, a matrix A, which is a square non-negative image matrix, you can draw a graph which has that as its adjacency matrix. Uh, so now in this um, edge shift, um, what are the points? Well, once we have this square matrix A, we draw some graph, so that A is its adjacency matrix. We call the edge set E, say. We take all the double infinite sequences um, on this alphabet E, such that uh, at every coordinate, the terminal vertex of Xi is the initial vertex of Xi plus 1. This <coughs> corresponds to an itinerary through the graph infinite and past in the future as described by the way the edges are traversed. So, inside this, um, inside this uh, edge shift in, in which we have uh, the point doing things like this. And you can see that the C, D, C, D, A, A, B, this illegal lock. Uh, we could never see, for example, a D followed by uh, a D. The rule will be violated. If we want to be uh, precise about the points, well, we can't just write these letters, you know, if we really want to be precise, which I usually don't want to be, um, then we somehow have to in indicate the coordinates. You could do that by putting a dot over the zero coordinate, uh, for example. Okay, so uh, every shift of finite type um, by a standard routine uh, technique is topologically conjugate to one of these edge shifts. So you can just think of edge shifts if you want to think of uh, just shifts of finite type up to isomorphism. Now, uh, from here, uh, I'm going to make a standing convention, which is that the edge shift would be defined by a matrix A, which is, uh, now, I, I kind of had a second thought about the convention I want to choose. Here I've written irreducible, which means that for every entry in the matrix, there's some positive power um, of the matrix, which sees a positive entry there, positive number in that entry. Uh, I'd rather assume that, uh, make the standing convention for some reason, that A is primitive, which means that you can take some power of that non-negative matrix, and every entry will be positive. Okay. All right, so that's the, uh, you know, for the mapping class group and for the statements of the theorems, it's not going to matter, but this is really kind of the more fundamental class. Um, okay, and I want, I want to assume the matrix is, is non-trivial, so by that I mean just that it's not a permutation. Not a permutation matrix. In this case, it's just not the matrix, which is one. That would give us the fixed point. That's a kind of degenerate case uh, that we want to avoid. And so, if you're new to these systems, just think of these edge shifts as being behaving a whole lot like a full shift on at least two symbols. Have the, the right point of view on these things uh, dynamically. Okay. So um, block codes. Now, suppose that we have a subshift, and uh, suppose, let's let um, this WK of X be the set of words of length K that can occur in a subshift. I wrote the words that go from coordinate 1 to coordinate K. We could have taken any K consecutive coordinates. We'd see the same set of words possible there because of the invariance of the set X under the shift. Now, a homomorphism of subshifts is always definable by something called a black code. There are little variations on just exactly how one might define a black code, but here's what it means. Um, one way of saying it, there are integers, I'm going to say A, B, with A less than or equal to B, and there's some function from words of length K of X to words of length 0 of Y, in other words, um, words of length K and X to symbols in the target system, where uh, k is equal to b minus a plus 1, which means that, uh, well, we'll see what it means. Uh, that 
the, 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 the morphism, the homomorphism is defined as follows. For every coordinate i, well, we want to find, if we have an input at x, we want to see what the output f of x equals y is. How do we define a, subs, a, 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 a double infinite sequence y? We define it by knowing what it is in every coordinate. Uh, what will it be in coordinate i? To see what it is in coordinate i, we just look up, up above it at x in the coordinates um, from i plus a to i plus b. We see that word of length k, and um, we apply the rule, um, capital C, to that word to define the, the word, uh, uh, the output symbol. So, for example, we might see something like, uh, suppose we had, there's x, here comes y, I want to see what's happening in this coordinate, I look at these, at this word, I apply the rule, I spit it out. If I want to see what's happening in uh, the next coordinate, now I look at that word, I apply the rule, and I spit it out, and so on forever. And you see that I described that rule without making reference to any particular coordinate, right? So it's just, this is what corresponds to the uh, shift invariance. And, uh, okay, so it turns out that all homomorphisms uh, of subshifts are defined by black codes. This is called the curtis hedlund lindman theorem from the initial paper on this topic in the 60s by Hedlund. It's got a, it, it's very easy to prove. It's more like a very fundamental observation uh, subject. Okay, so we just finished part one. I won't go as fast through the other parts. Okay, the automorphism group. Okay, so for our, um, if we have a topological dynamical system, uh, the automorphism group, uh, ought t, is uh, denoted by this ought t. And um, what is an automorphism? An automorphism is a homeomorphism uh, from the system to itself, which is an isomorphism. Okay, so it's a homeomorphism from the system to itself, which commutes with t. And uh, if we compose two of those or take an inverse, we have another such thing, so we have a group. And our uh, interest here is going to be the automorphism group of sigma A. Where again, this A is primitive, corresponding to sigma A being mixing. Uh, well, um, so the first, uh, the first remark about this group ought T is that it's countable. Um, why is it countable? Well, Morphism is given by a block code. There are only countably many block codes. So um, the automorphism group is uh, countable. But we'll see that the automorphism group, and actually you have seen if you were at Michael Schroeder's le lecture, that it's uh, complicated. Um, but before we see what's complicated, let's see that there's something in it. Get an idea about how you could find these uh, uh, automorphisms. Well. Um, a block code is a completely general way of defining one. There may be other ways which are more uh, insightful, convenient, uh, robust, etc. cetera. Uh, we might define automorphism without reference to the block code which we know exists. So uh, here's a simple, uh, I'll give you a simple version of uh, an, uh, a technique called the marker method, which, is going, which can be used to show that there are many, many automorphisms in complicated ways. Okay, so here's the, the here's, before we quite get to the marker method, here's, the, uh, here's an example. We have the full shift on three symbols, 0, 1, 2. Okay, then uh, we can define a map as follows. Wherever we see 1, 2, the word 1, 2 occurring in a point, we replace it with the word 0, 1. So for example, here's x. Uh, well, there's uh, 1, 2, we put in 0, 1, keep going, there's 1, 2, 0, 1, etc. Okay, so that's the, that's the rule. Um, well, that's a map. Um, it's, I, I described it without reference to uh, any particular reference coordinate. It's going to commute with the shift. Um, well, you could go backwards, too. Um, uh, you could send, if you see 0, 1, you could send it back to 1, 2. So it's invertible. Um, now, you have to be 
uh, careful uh, with this kind of thing. Uh, suppose instead I'd said uh, replace 0, 0 with 0, 1. Okay? That won't work because that won't give you a well-defined map. If I happen to look at uh, a word 0, 0, what will I put down? Well, if I replace 0, 1 here, I'd be doing that. But if I replaced 0, 1 here, I'd be doing that. So this is not actually giving me a rule, which is giving you a well-defined symbol everywhere. So you have to be careful that whatever you do is going to give something well-defined. And you can see that what went wrong here was made possible by the fact that 0, 0, 0 can, uh, this word 0, 0 has proper self-overlaps. Okay. So, if there, yes? Um, Um, zero one, I think. I think the inverse is uh, is well defined because zero one cannot overlap itself. Mm -hmm. Want to say? Oh, yeah. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So you're quite right. <laughs> it's not objective. <laughs> That's true. Thank you. Thank you for correcting me. Um, but let me, make, let me say uh, what it is. Uh, it is a. Um, uh, not objective, but it is well defined. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so for the Markham method, there are, there are two aspects. One, one is that it must be well defined, and that, that is a thousand stuff over And then there's just a little detail of actually getting something which is one to one. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, all right, so it takes a village. Uh, so uh, now uh, let's. Uh, look at a system, one systematic way to do this. So suppose we have a permutation, uh, I'll call it pi, of n elements. And uh, uh, I'm going to use this on, in some way on some set of words, uh, of, n, of n words. And I want these words to involve only the symbol 0 and 1. And they must all be of the same length. Okay, there are lots of possibilities. Okay, uh, and now I'll define something which will be an automorphism <laughs> of the flow three shift on symbols 0, 1, and 2 uh, as follows. If I take any of these words uh, in here, and if I see that it immediately follows a 2 in a point, then uh, I, I replace this W immediately following a 2 with its image under the permutation. Okay, so for example, the word W, and we do this everywhere in the point. So the word W, for example, uh, might, be five, uh, might be 0, 0, 0, and uh, that would be perhaps by the permutation sent to 0, 1, 0. Okay. Now, throwing in this 2 uh, has the effect that now no word of this form can properly overlap any other word of this form. So we get a well-defined map. And then the fact that I'm using a permutation you know, these words, a certain set of words of constant length tells me that I'll have an element of finite order, which we'll come back. Okay, so this 2 serves as a marker. Now, um, let's uh, uh, notice that, you know, we've just shown how to very easily embed the symmetric group into the automorphism group of the, uh, of the three shift. The symmetric group on in letters for any n. Every finite group is a subgroup of uh, some symmetric group, so we've just embedded every finite group into the automorphism group of um, 
the three shift. Okay, so that, that's pretty easy and right away you have that. But that's a, that's a start. You can see that we were doing something pretty simple-minded with the two. Uh, we could look at uh, more complicated words. We could look at sets of words. Um, you know, certain uh, patterns of sets of words. Maybe we could have words overlap, but overlap in such a way that while they overlap, there's not a change. Uh, we could take something we know how to do and take a conjugacy and make it look more complicated. We could get an extension theorem, do something on a subsystem and extend it to the whole system. So this uh, little idea here is, is just a start, but uh, I hope you can see that maybe you could really do quite a lot. Also, uh, here I, I started with... Um, using this 2 as a marker. Well, you know, suppose instead of doing that, I used a, a, a 1 as a marker. And I did the same thing with um, 1 followed by some word on 0 and 2. Okay. There's no reason why such a thing would have to commute. Okay. And, uh, you know, write something down and see you've got elements of infinite order and you can start controlling patterns and, and building up quite a lot. So this, this is kind of um, the root of how we can get a lot of automorphisms uh, in the automorphism group. And, um, so, uh, as, as you heard from Michael, you can get free groups, uh, direct sum of common many copies of Z. Every residually finite common group, which is a union of finite groups. Um, uh, the fundamental group of any two manifold. The last two are from Kim and Rouse. The first two were paper long ago of me Pardon me? Yeah. Uh, and so, um, yeah, so there are only, you know, perhaps before this conference fin finishes, someone in this room will politely explain to me that really after all these years I should know that there are some other obstructions, but I only know of two um, obstructions to embedding a countable group into the automorphism group of uh, such a shift. Uh, well, first of all, it must be residually finite, as you've heard, and we'll see again. Um, also, every finitely generated subgroup of the group must have a solvable word problem. That's, that's not hard to show given that you have block codes and given that you can decide uh, when a word of, when any given word, given any word, you can decide whether that word occurs in a point in the shift. Okay, so you have those two obstructions. Uh, what are the other ones? And, um, uh, you know, it's a kind of very interesting question right now. Does SL3Z embed into this group? or the discrete Heisenberg group, even. Um, I don't know. Uh, uh, using the idea of distortion elements from geometric group theory, uh, Sear, Franks, Kra, and Pettit um, show a group, this is on the archive, they show a group with logarithmic distortion, which I want to find, such as SLKZ with K at least three, cannot embed in the automorphism group of sigma A for, sorry, this should be not sigma A, but uh, the automorphism group of t for any zero entropy shift t. I don't know if it can embed in sigma a, but it can't embed in something zero entropy. Um, okay, very quickly, uh, counting automorphisms. Um, uh, you could look at the number of black codes, which depend on, uh, you know, looking at words of length n. I don't care really exactly where it spits out, but looking at words of length n. Now, how many are there, and how many of those are invertible? Well, let's just look at the uh, full shifts uh, for simplicity. You might think, well, it's pretty hard to be invertible. Maybe there aren't so many. Um, kind of depends on what you mean by so many. So um, for, uh, some, if we consider the full shift on K symbols, the number of black codes uh, into a particular coordinate, depending on words of length n, that's the number of function from words of length n, there are k to the n of those, into the set of k elements, so they're k to the k to the n. And so if we take, uh, if we take a W exponential growth rate by looking at limit 1 over n log log, we compute log k. Okay, so that's the W exponential growth rate. Kim and Rash proved that if instead you use the invertible block codes, the block codes giving automorphisms, 
Um, you still get log k. So there are a lot of them. Okay. And um, a question here is, um, the first lift, give a better asymptotic formula for the invertible black codes. I mean, to give the Dimly exponential growth rate doesn't seem to be very sharp. But it's, it's the only thing that's been done. And uh, it's, uh, the Dimly exponential growth rate um, is problematic for a couple of reasons. One is it's, it's difficult to do convincing computational experimental experiments on properties of automorphisms, or on cellular automata for that matter. Because there's, there are just so many of them, you have to get a convincing survey. Um, and then uh, it seems completely impractical to get properties of automorphisms by some argument using induction on the range of a defining block code. You know, this is very non-amenable. OK, so what can we do? Uh, how can we learn something about a complicated group such as the automorphism group? So, and we look to guidance provided by the Bible. Right? <laughs> Looking at the power of the religious right in the United States in the last election, we looked at the Bible. Okay. And by their actions, ye shall know them. Okay? How do you, how do you learn about a group? You learn, look at how it can act. Okay. And now, there, basically, for this group, if there's a take home message, there are basically two, and so far only two actions of this group from which we've really be able, been able to learn something. Um, one is the action on periodic points, and the other is the action on the dimension module. And we learn especially by uh, relating these actions to each other. OK, so what's the action on periodic points? Uh, well, um, you know, for any n, uh, what is the point of period n for the, for the shift? There's some word of length n, and you just keep repeating it. Okay, so there are only finitely many points of period n. Okay, if you take an automorphism of the shift, um, it will map points of a given period into points of the same period. It's a nice morphism. And uh, so the set of points of a given fixed period will be an invariant set. It will be a finite invariant set. That finite invariant set has a finite automorphism group. So if we restrict the automorphism group, to automorphisms of the points of period n, we get a map from the automorphism group into a finite group. And then the points of period n are, the points of all periods are dense. So uh, points will be separated by, by these maps. So this, this shows that the, um, that the automorphism group of, um, of, of sigma a, or the automorphism group of any subshift which has uh, dense periodic points, is residually finite. Now, for uh, contrast, uh, let's uh, just remark, for various subshifts, the automorphism group is not residually finite. Um, there's a minimal subshift whose automorphism group contains a copy of the rationals, which is not residually finite. And so it's not about recurrence. Um, this property of residual finiteness. And also, many re re reducible shifts, some shifts of finite type, many more, Salo and Schraubner, as you've already heard, I, I contain a copy of uh, S infinity, the union of the symmetric groups Sn, where well, Sn is the permutations uh, uh, 1 through n. OK. Um, now, what about the dimension module? Um, what, what is it? Well. Um, Got different descriptions and presentations. Uh, here's the easiest thing I can say. Suppose we have a k by k matrix. Um, then we can take the direct limit group, um, where the bonding maps are all uh, multiplication by a. And uh, I like to take uh, multiplication on row vectors, uh, but uh, you know it, it's different. But uh, you know, take your pick, and the theory's the same. Um, okay, now. Uh, a itself induces an automorphism of this uh, direct limit group. Um, and this pair, this group, and this induced automorphism is a presentation of the dimension module of the shift. Okay, So this group, together with uh, this induced uh, automorphism, that's the dimension module. We can make it a real module, not to worry. Um, so, uh, for example, uh, suppose we have the matrix 2. Now, in that case, this group, direct limit group, is isomorphic as a group to the dyadic rationals. And, uh, well, what is a, 
uh, an isomorphism of the dyadic rationals, uh, it's multiplication by a power of two, and maybe multiplication by plus or minus one. Now, um, there's a minor order condition that is re we require on an automorphism of the dimension module. Uh, and here, what it means is that that multiplication by minus one is not allowed. <coughs> Don't worry about that. Anyway, so uh, we throw that out, and what's left is just um, multiplication by a power of two. So um, this uh, automorphism group of the dimension module is uh, isomorphic to C. Some other examples, uh, we get, say, z adjoin 1, 6, direct sum z cubed, z squared, direct sum sl 3z, um, lots of other things. Uh, just because of time, I won't, have, I won't be able to say more, but uh, these groups can be understood very, very concretely. Um, and so you should think of this as algebraic invariance that you can understand. Uh, usually, but not always, the automorphism group of the dimension module is finitely generated. Now, what's the dimension representation? Um, okay, well, fact. Uh, an element of the automorphism group of the shift of finite type induces an automorphism of this dimension module. U induces U hat. How? There are a couple of equivalent ways. No time to tell you, but it does. And this, uh, this induced uh, automorphism gives us a group homomorphism from the automorphism group of the shift to the automorphism group of the dimension module. Okay, so if you have an automorphism of the two-shift, this is going to give a you know, map into Z. Um, okay, and this homomorphism, which uh, describes the action, not sigma A and not dimension models, it's called the dimension representation. Okay, so uh, again, think of this as just some nice algebraic functor, um, which we can attach to the uh, automorphism group. Now, let's let at, a, at zero of sigma a denote the kernel of this dimension representation. It's called a group of inert automorphism. So this is, this is the, the large, complicated part of the, um, of the automorphism group. This is where we build up all those Markov automorphisms. Um, and, um, and we know a great deal about how this group can act on uh, finite subsystems, or, fi or in fact, any proper subsystem uh, of the shift. So we think of the, the group as basically you have this algebraic thing, and then you have the kernel, and that's, that's where the mystery is. OK, so I want to, since we know so little, I want to show you we at least know something something that's pretty non-trivial and amazing involved a lot of people. Um, so uh, let's consider a couple of homomorphisms that we can get from the periodic point um, actions. So let's consider n. So we're going to look at points of least period n. They have shift orbits of size n. Um, now, and how does an automorphism of the shift act on the points of period n? Well, Michael mentioned this in his lecture, but I'll Say it again. Uh, let's be concrete. We take, if there are k orbits of size n, from each one we pick a representative. Now, what does an automorphism do on these representatives? It takes a representative, uh, it sends it into some other orbit, so it sends it to, or maybe itself, its own orbit, so it sends it to, it sends it to a power of the shift applied to a representative. Okay? Where J is obtained by permutation of I corresponding to the orbit's permutation. So we have some homomorphisms from this. First, we'll take the sign of that permutation. Uh, the sign is zero if it's even, and it's one if it's odd. Uh, second, we can compute what we call the gyration number. Um, and for that, we just add up these shifts. One way to describe this. Add up these shifts, modulo n, modulo the orbit length. We have to check it's a homomorphism. It is a homomorphism. It's well-defined. Um, and these are the only, um, in general, only the, the only abelian, homo, only homomorphisms into abelian groups that you can get from automorphisms of this type. Okay, so there we have. We have sine, we have gyration. Um, now we have SGCC, where SGCC 
uh, stands for sign gyration compatibility condition. And uh, this came from a paper of me and Krieger, and this has a certain Germanic quality to it. Uh, just put those words together and they do the job. Okay, and uh, so um, now we're going to define this as a homomorphism from the automorphism group of the shift to Z mod N. What is it? Well, it's going to be the gyration homomorphism plus something else. What's the something else? Well, we're going to add up a bunch of signs, a bunch of zeros and ones, okay? And we're going to multiply by n over 2, okay? So if we have an even number of signs here, which are um, 1, then we'll get 2 times n over 2, but this will vanish. Otherwise, we'll get n over 2. The sum is over integers k at least once, so the 2 of the k divides n. What does that mean? It's, it's easiest to just give you an example, and then you'll see. Okay, so the, the, this SGC, SGGC, SGCC, I have trouble myself, SGCC is just the gyration number if n is odd. Okay, n is not divisible by 2. Okay, what if it is, what if n is even? Well, for example, SGCC, um, if n is 24, it's going to be the gyration, plus the sine of 12, plus the sine of 6, plus the sine of 3. Okay, we can't divide by powers of 2 anymore, so we're done. Add those signs up and multiply by 6. Uh, 12, 12, sorry. I, I fixed that. Oh, well. <laughs> Maybe there'll be other things that didn't get compiled. Uh, anyway, yeah, so that, that should be 12. This should be 12. Um, okay, so and for any automorphism of the shift, um, this SGCCN, it's either the gyration or it's the gyration plus n over 2. Okay, so there's this kind of mysterious math thing which, uh, you know, in the Cantor set, it looks at the points of, say, period 24, but then also in the Cantor set, where everything's homogeneous set-wise, uh, it looks at these periodic orbits, which are just somewhere else. Okay, and now there's a factorization theorem due to Kim Rausch and Wagner, a combination, oops, a combination of a lot of work. Um, and it's the following. Uh, for all n, there's a homomorphism I'll call gamma n, from the automorphisms group of the dimension module into z mod n, so that SGCC is the dimension representation followed by gamma. So we have uh, um, the automorphism group of the shift. Uh, uh, we have the automorphism group of the mission module. And uh, we have a commuting uh, diagram uh, here. Uh, it's all in. So, Okay, well, well, what does this tell us in particular? Suppose that, uh, suppose we have something, the automorphism group, which is in the kernel. If the dimension representation, well, it's got to be in the kernel here, that means this thing vanishes. That means that that automorphism, the way that that automorphism acts on points of uh, period n is quite constrained by how it happened to be acting on smaller points. There are obstructions to how, how it can move uh, periodic points around. Okay, SGCC vanishes for all n. Okay, and that and that is true if uh, that's true for uh, all u in the kernel of the dimension representation. Okay, so um, and it turns out kind of remarkably that this obstruction is basically the only obstruction to extending automorphisms of subsystems, automorphisms of the automorphisms of the of, of elements of the kernel dimension representation. So we know how that kernel acts uh, altogether. And that's a, a lot of work, which was a whole other story. Okay, uh, we know more. Um, we can show for some, some shifts of finite type, the kernel of the dimension representation is not generated by elements of finite order. The obstructions we can demonstrate are all finite index, and often we can't demonstrate any. Um, okay, so uh, anyway, so this, this mastery of actions on subsystems is generally not good enough for global questions, and here's an example. Suppose 
Suppose we have, for all n, a automorphism that it permutes the orbits of size n by an even permutation. Must it be in the commutator? It approximate its actions on periodic orbits up to any finite level, but that doesn't answer the question. Isomorphism of a couple of uh, automorphisms in group. Um, well, for all we know, there's such an isomorphism if and only if the one is isomorphic to the other shift or its inverse. And there's only one tool known to give examples of a couple of automorphisms groups which are not uh, isomorphic. It's the theorem of Ryan at the center of the automorphism group of a, the shift is the powers of the shift. Um, so, for example, the two shift has no square root. The four shift has a square root. So one automorphism group, there's a generator of the center which has a square root. The other group, there's a generator of the center which does not. So those two groups can't be isomorphic. And just crude variations on that are all, all we can do. We don't really touch the problem. Um, so, uh, of course, very familiar to this audience uh, is a way of going at this is to say, well, suppose we have a group isomorphism with a kernel dimension representation of one shift to the other. Is, does it have to be induced by a homeomorphism, which is a conjugacy between the shifts or the inverse of one to the other? Or maybe you could write the commutator here instead of writing uh, just the kernel dimension representation, although we have not such a great understanding of what the commutator is. But I'd like to emphasize one thing, which is a really huge difference between the corresponding question for full groups of Cantor systems or the L1 full group or you know, other kinds of things. Uh, in, in those cases, um, as, as far as I've seen, uh, where you have a result of this, this kind, well, let's just say for the full group here, um, there's a rich supply of full group elements, which are the identity of large open sets. Kind of, you know, something's the identity there and you're acting locally. Uh, but here, points with dense orbits, or dense, well, if a conjugacy is the identity on one such point, it's the identity everywhere. You know, if, it's, it's the identity, if you have something is, which is the identity on a non-empty open set, it's the identity. The answer to the shift. Okay, so the automorphism group is, is different that way. So I suspect that the answer might be the same, but something different has to happen for the methods. Um, any ideas? Okay, so let's, uh, let's go on to flow equivalence. This is the third part. We've gone through the automorphism group. Kind of. uh, and now, uh, this, this is much newer. Automorphisms was not new. So if T, uh, what is flow equivalence? Uh, if T is a homeomorphism from a compact metric space to itself, topological dynamical system, we're interested in T being the shift. But we'll just consider this more general T for the moment. Uh, so the mapping torus of T is the quotient, I'll call it Y of T, of X cross the wheels by the identifications, which could be described as saying X comma S plus N is equivalent to sigma of the, uh, another type of T of the N, X, S uh, for all X and for all S and R, and N and Z. Um, more concretely, um, this mapping torus, we can think of just picking these relations to X cross 0, 1. Uh, that will map onto the mapping torus under the quotient map. And you only need here the identifications X1 is uh, equivalent to T of X0. So there's a, there's a picture of the mapping torus. That horizontal line is X. There's 0, 1. Take a point on the bottom, take the line up to the top, the point on the bottom is x comma 0, at the top we have x comma 1, and that's uh, identified with t of x comma 0. Uh, so there's a um, continuous R action, the flow on uh, x cross R pushes down to the mapping torus, where the time t map is just to add t in the real coordinate. Uh, and the, you know, this pushes down to a flow in the mapping torus called the suspension flow. And you can just visualize it here. You just flow up to the top, and then you're already on the bottom, and you just keep flowing up. That's the suspension flow. 
Um, now, two homeomorphisms are flow equivalent. If there's a homeomorphism between their ma ma mapping tori, mapping flow elements to flow elements, and preserving the direction of the flow. Might not be a conjugacy of the real flows, but it's, it's this. There's a long history of the study of flow equivalence, which I'll skip going back to trying to understand solutions to differential equations by looking at cross sections, but uh, we'll just go on. Uh, let's let um, F of T uh, be the group of self flow equivalences of T, and we'll let F0 be the subgroup of those isotopic to the identity in this group. Okay, so we define the mapping class group of this homeomorphism to be the group uh, F of T mod F not of T. Okay, so this should be, be resonant to those of you who look at mapping class groups. You know so much more than I. Um, and uh, so what's the idea here? Well, if we take all of these self flow equivalences, there are going to be a lot of trivial ones. We'll just maybe wiggle our orbits a little bit. We're not really learning anything about that. And we have an uncountable group, so we'd like to get rid of that and see what's left. And, um, and that's the mapping class group. And this, this mapping class group plays the role for flow equivalence that the automorphism group plays for topological conjugacy. And uh, what about the mapping class group of a shift to finite type? Okay, so let's consider this and, and, con and I'll contrast it to the automorphism group of the shift of finite type. Okay. The, the shift is irreducible and uh, non-trivial, even assuming primitive and non-trivial. Okay, so a fundamental theorem here is a classification theorem, Franks following work of Bowen and Franks and Perry and Sullivan. Two non-trivial shifts of finite type are flow equivalent. Uh, they're defined by matrices A and B if only if two conditions hold. One is that the, the groups which are the co kernel groups of I minus A and I minus B are isomorphic. Okay? So if, if A is K by K, I minus A is K by K, the co kernel is described with the map given by matrix multiplication from ZK to ZK. Okay? So it's the, uh, the range space ZK modulo the image. And this can be any finitely generated abelian group. Uh, the other invariant is that the determinant of I minus A is the determinant of I minus B. Everything about the second invariant is contained in the first, except perhaps, except the sign plus or minus, if those numbers are uh, not zero. Okay, so keep that in mind, and uh, now we'll just kind of zip through some properties of this group. Um, these are taken from a, a joint work with Bampong uh, Chui Srichai in Thailand, and uh, this is a manuscript of this work is also posted next to this talk. Um, so, so first, let's recall that every automorphism of a subshift can be defined by a block code. That's a way to get a handle on it. There is an analogous notion uh, developed in a paper of myself, Toko Carlson, and Simon Eilers. Um, for a subshift, every element of its mapping class group has a representative defined by, defined by a flow code. Okay? This, this looks like a block code, but with words maybe of different lengths, in place of symbols. It kind of given by return words to some discrete cross-section. No time to really say what it is, just to, sort of like a block code, a little more complicated. Words instead of symbols. But because you have that, um, we can conclude that, there, uh, that this mapping class group is a, is a countable group. There are only countably many flow codes, just as there are only countably many block codes. And uh, now by construction, this mapping class group is not residually finite. Um, it contains a, a copy of the infinite of S infinity, so it's not residually finite. Yeah, it's not looking too good. Um, the center. We use the center to differentiate off automorphism groups of shifts of finite type. It's trivial. Oh, that's no use. Uh, now, if you have an automorphism of a shift, it induces a flow equivalence. In fact, it induces a conjugacy of the suspension flow, so in particular, a, homo a self-homeomorphism. Um, and so, uh, you know, the corresponding map from the automorphism group into the mapping class group, that has a kernel, in this case, which is equal to just the powers of the shift. But that's pretty nice. 
like two left. Ah, okay, great. Um, but uh, you can throw it over. Okay, so it's the powers of the shift. This is where we were. Um, and now if, if sigma b is flow equivalent to sigma a, and then we have a homeomorphism, this homeomorphism of the mapping tori, which induces an isomorphism of the mapping class groups. The rubber mapping class group of sigma b contain at sigma b mod powers of the shift. Well, that, um, that now embeds in the mapping class group of sigma a. Okay? Well, this at sigma b mod sigma b, that's almost all of at sigma b. So this mapping class group, not only does it have at, almost all at, a, at sigma a in it, it's got all those other automorphism groups of all those other shifts, um, and in many different ways. Uh, given by these different flow equivalences. So this group is really, really complicated. It's got all these things going on. Um, and uh, because there are many quite different shifts of finite type, which are flow equivalent according to those complete Franks invariants. Now, um, one way of describing this in a little bit of an invariant way is that if you have a flow equivalence which arises from an embedding of an automorphism like that, uh, there's a cross-section of that suspension flow and um, the flow equivalence uh, has a, cl uh, a class of the homeomorphism in the mapping class group as a representative, which is an automorphism of, it's given by an automorphism of a return map to an invariant cross section. Anyway, so you can look at invariant cross sections, and from that, you can show that there are many elements of this mapping class group which cannot arise from automorphisms in this way. So not only does this group have all those automorphism groups, it's got a whole lot of other stuff that uh, you know, behaves not at all like automorphisms. Um, so circles, uh, periodic points of the shift, when you look at the periodic point of the shift, it gives rise to a circle in the mapping class, in, in, the, ma in the mapping torus. And um, the mapping class group acts by permutations on this countable set of circles. Um, uh, in this particular case, for this uh, mixing shift to finite type, the action on the set by permutations is faithful. That's not true for general subshifts, or even general shifts to finite type. Um, and, uh, and now, the action, the mapping class group on the set of circles by permutations is n-transitive for all n. Take any two of this. Okay, so, we had, it was very helpful to have those invariant finite sets of periodic points. For the automorphism group, it's gone. There's nothing, I can't, can't see anything like it. Um, now, uh, we had constraints on extensions uh, in, the, um, in the case of the automorphism group. Uh, so there's a theorem of myself and again, Carlson and others. <laughs> if we have a, a map, which is a flow equivalence from one subsystem of the mapping torus of sigma a to another one, they don't even have to be the same, then that map extends to a flow equivalent of the whole thing. You can extend anything. So there's a tremendously rich supply of things you can do with this, this mapping class group. Now, analogous to the dimension representation, there's something uh, I'll call the bowen franks representation. And uh, we can uh, present... Uh, Present that as follows. <clears throat> Remember, this co kernel of I minus A was playing a big role. It's called the Bowen Franks group. Um, it's got automorphisms. It's a finitely generated abelian group. It's got a group of automorphisms. Um, and just as with the dimension representation here, there's a, a map which is well defined from the mapping class group into the automorphisms of the Bowen Franks group. So I'll call that the Bowen Franks representation. Now, in contrast to the representation, this beta A is always surjective for all A. Turns out not to be true for the dimension representation. Now, the range group is finitely generated for all A. Um, okay, so in some sense, it's better here than it was for the shift. We kind of know everything about this, this guy. But um, suppose we have 
the kernel. We look at the kernel of this. Okay, that's analogous to this kernel we don't know a whole lot about for yellow morphism of the groove. We really know nothing about this thing. So, um, except that it acts very richly. Um, so here's some questions, sample ones. Does the, the map from the homeomorphisms giving these flow equivalences into the mapping class group is a split? I mean, is the mapping class group of the shift even a, a group of homeomorphisms? Uh, is this group, uh, which is the kernel of the bone franks rep representation, is it simple? I, I kind of think it is, you know, because it's just so complicated. Everything, it's hard for anything to get separated out. I, I'm kind of torn as to whether to conjecture that or just ask it. The argument against conjecturing is, well, what's your evidence? <laughs> Not that we can answer easier questions. Uh, is it equal to the commutator? Is it generated by involutions? Is it finitely generated? Things we don't know. Um, and uh, if sigma A and sigma B are math flow equivalent, uh, we don't know anything about whether the respective mapping class groups are isomorphic. They could be always, they could be sometimes, they could be never, for all that I could, I should show. Uh, so the problem is every group isomorphism from one mapping class group to another induced by a homeomorphism of mapping tori. Again, I'd sort of guess yes, but uh, if the answer is yes, remember it's, there's a somewhat different character to this problem than is the case where the group uh, can act like the identity on a big piece. So then the last question I'll ask, I don't know this either, is, is, is it even sophic? So there's, you have some kind of control in the distortion of elements that are not actually automorphisms. I mean, does that constrain the algebraic structure? Or? Uh, you would think it is something, but I, I don't know. One kind of related question that has to do with distortion. If you have a block code, depending on, let's say, coordinates or minus r to r, the kth power of that now iterated k power. Can be defined by a black code from uh, minus rk to rk. So the range multiplies by k. But it could happen that the range might suddenly get to be much smaller. And this is not the only reason. Something. 